Subject this morning, spiritual obedience, freedom, or slavery. That is a much discussed question. We hear so often, how is it, why is it that you can follow rules and regulations or some have the nerve to say, how can you subject your will to someone else's will? Well, those are natural questions, but unless, unless you realize the reality underlying the outward consciousness, you will not appreciate the true meaning of spiritual obedience. And I will try to point out this morning that spiritual obedience, instead of le leading to slavery, leads to the greatest freedom. Now spiritual obedience, let us discuss that first, means first adhering, adhering to spiritual law. And another definition is to be guided by the cognizing conscience of the soul or to be guided by God. That's all. That's what spiritual obedience means. Two, adhere to spiritual law and to be guided by the presence of God as the cognizing conscience of the soul. So let us take an illustration or two first of adherence to spiritual law. We have a reference in the Gita which is very apropos at this time and I will read it for you. He who, having cast aside the ordinary, the ordinances of the scriptures, followeth the promptings of desire, or ego consciousness, he who does that attaineth not to perfection nor happiness, nor the highest goal. Therefore, let the scriptures be thy authority in determining what ought to be done or what ought not to be done. And so, spiritual discipline, one of the first requisites, is to adhere to spiritual law, to follow the admonitions of the scriptures. Now we also find that in the Bible, especially concerning John and Jesus. I will just take those two uh, at this time. Jesus as you know, was at that time held in far greater esteem than John the Baptist. Yet Jesus came and submitted to baptism by John the Baptist, saying, this is the way of all righteousness. That is, Jesus adhered to spiritual law. He had spiritual obedience and he followed the law as he said, the way of righteousness. And at that time, remember, Jesus, as John said, I am nothing compared to he who cometh after me, referring to Jesus who was to come. Yet Jesus succumbed to spiritual law. He followed spiritual law. But he also later said, John the Baptist, no man born of woman is as great as John the Baptist. Showing that he followed the spiritual law whereby his guru was his greatest treasure and he held his guru, John, who previously was Elijah, in the highest esteem. No man born of woman is as great as my guru, John the Baptist. And so we have in the scriptures illustrations which clearly point out that adherence to spiritual law is one of the first requisites to spiritual obedience. Now I have one more reference. Jesus' words in Matthew, the 26th chapter, 53rd and 54th verses, wherein he says, 
thinkest thou that I cannot pray to my father, and he shall presently give me more than twelve legions of angels? <coughs> Jesus did not have to be crucified if he didn't want to be. He had the power. God was with him. <coughs> God would have given him those twelve legions of angels. But Jesus, having a great desire for spiritual obedience, saw beyond the ordinary law into the higher law, and he adhered to that higher spiritual law. For he goes on to say, But if I do this, if I demand that God save me from this, he says, How then shall the scriptures be fulfilled? that thus it must be. And so Jesus followed, succumbed to the scriptures that the law might be fulfilled. So great was his spiritual obedience. And there you have illustrations of the first aspect of spiritual obedience. Now the second aspect is, as I have said, to be guided by God. To be guided by the soul, the cognizing conscience of the soul. And we have one reference here in the Bible in Daniel. Daniel, the 10th chapter, the 12th verse. Fear not, Daniel, for from the first day that thou didst set thine heart to understand and to chasten thyself before thy God, thy words were heard, and I am come for thy word. Daniel following spiritual obedience, saw that it was proper to be guided by the cognizing conscience of the soul. For it says, When thou chasten thyself before thy God, that's the soul, that's the presence of God in us, is the soul. And so Daniel elected to be guided by the soul. And from that moment, God heard him, and God was with him. And so the first illustration of proper guidance, which is so necessary and which is the outcome of spiritual obedience, we obey spiritually that we may be guided by God, not by other consciousness, not by ego consciousness, which I will come to in a minute. And so following the soul within is necessary for spiritual obedience. If we have spiritual obedience, we will follow the soul. But comes the question, what if you do not know the soul? What if you do not know God within? What are you going to do? You're willing, but how can you follow the soul unless you know it? That's where the guru comes in. And so, an illustration of spiritual obedience by following God within means that the greatest spiritual obedience is that you follow a channel of God, the voice of God, as the beloved master in our case. And so obedience to the channel, to the spiritual perceptor, is the greatest thing, is the second requisite of spiritual obedience. Following the guru, why? Following the per, uh, spiritual perceptor, why? Because his will is wisdom guided from God. That's all. And so when people say to you, how can you follow, how can you bend your will to the rules and regulations of self-realization fellowship? Just tell them. Because the master, being one with God, whose will was guided by God, has set rules and regulations, which if I follow, and which if I am spiritually obedient to those rules and regulations, and to those who are carrying on his will, I will be able to differentiate between ordinary free will and wisdom-guided will. Having that differentiation, then I shall have true spiritual freedom. I will not be acting automatically from my ego. And so in following the spiritual perceptor, it means in having spiritual obedience to the guru, to the spiritual perceptor, it means to follow not only his direct admonitions, but to accept the discipline as promulgated by his rules and regulations and the things he has set down to be done 
when he left this work and went into the great cosmic consciousness of God. And so, adherence to the guru, obedience to the spiritual perceptor, is very necessary. Then, then, you will be guided by the wisdom-guided will of God, not by your own will. So then we come to the second point, the second phase of our discussion this morning, true freedom, or freedom or slavery. Will spiritual obedience, which I think you understand now, adhering to spiritual law, or following the soul within, will that spiritual obedience give you freedom, or will it give you slavery? So that's the point which we must now discuss. And we can find our answer in understanding what true freedom is. That's the point. And until, only when you subjugate the ego within you, only when you subjugate that, rise above the guidance of the ego, will you know what free will is. That is very important. Until you subjugate your will, ordinary will, guided by ego, do you realize what guides you? You are guided by environment, latent impulses, and habit. You say this particular day, I'm going out and I'm going to do just as I please. I'm going to exercise my free will and do just as I please. You're not going to do just as you please. You're going to do what the ego consciousness in you says to do through the suggestions from environment, from latent, hidden latent tendencies, and finally from deep ingrained habits. That's what you're going to do. Is that free will? No. That is known as ordinary free will. But true free will is different. True free will comes from independent action from the high vantage point of soul consciousness. But you do not have that. You do not know that, but your spiritual perceptor, your guru, being one with God, has that wisdom guided will, and if you follow him through spiritual obedience, then you will see the difference between ordinary, automatic, ego-guided will and the will, the true freedom which comes by following God within you as the soul. Now, you cannot do that. You cannot know that until you follow one who has wisdom-guided will and see the difference. That's the important thing. I remember a friend of mine was working in an insane asylum, not uh, just a hospital, I guess it was. He was taking his internship there. And he told me one time, he saw these two inmates out walking around. They were saying to one another, one was saying to the other, what do they think we are, crazy here? Well, because those two didn't know the difference between the normal consciousness and what they had. So when we act ordinarily from ego consciousness in an automatic way, we don't, do not see the difference between the higher state of consciousness or the consciousness which comes from true freedom, from action, independent action from the soul. That's a very important part. And so if you are spiritually obedient to the spiritual perceptor and follow what he has laid down, realizing that his will is guided by God's wisdom, then you gradually will reach that point and you will see the difference between ordinary, automatic, ego-guided will and action, and action from the high vantage point of soul consciousness. Having that, having that, that is not slavery. That's true freedom. Because then when a situation comes up, you can act as you should. You will know whether you are being influenced by environment, hidden tendencies, or habit. You will know right off. Knowing that, you will act in an independent way with true freedom. And so you see, uh, following or adhering to spiritual discipline, spiritual obedience, instead of giving slavery as it appears on the surface, 
I can understand, you can understand how people feel when they see you following, it seems blindly, the rules and regulations of a religious colony or of the scriptures. But you are not running into slavery. You are building up within yourself the consciousness of true freedom, which comes from following spiritual obedience, being spiritually obedient. So now we come to the question of how to uh, escape being an automaton guided by the ego. That's the first part of the question. How to escape being guided automatically by environment, latent impulses, and habit. And it seems so real when we are guided by that, we feel I'm going to do just as I like. But you're not going to do just as you like. You're going to do what is suggested to you. So the question is how to escape that. And the second aspect is how to exercise wisdom-guided independent action which comes from acting from soul consciousness and which gives true freedom. Now that's the question. What are we going to do? How are we going to do this? How are we going to answer the question? The answer is Spiritual obedience to two things, guidance of the scriptures and, secondly, spiritual obedience to the channel God has sent you. Now, if you do not follow and are not obedient to something, you will end up with nothing. We have to have that spiritual obedience, first to the scriptures and, just as important, to the channel God has sent to, to guide us back home. You remember the master's guru said to him, I will love you always, unconditionally, because God sent me to bring you back home to him. And so God has sent this channel to bring all of those who will, who will follow and be spiritually obedient to bring them back home to cosmic consciousness. So that's the answer. The answer is to do those two things. I have one or two illustrations. Let us um, take them up first as to the guidance of the scriptures. The guidance of the scriptures we find in the Gita, in the sixth discourse, sixth discourse, 46th line. Remember, we must follow the scriptures if we are to answer this question. There we read, the yogi is greater than the ascetic. Bawaji said, a little of this religion will save one from suffering. Therefore, the admonitions of the scriptures are to be what? To be a yogi, because yoga means union, contact with God. God within us is the holy vibration with its light, sound, and its love in the heart. Contact that. How? Through yoga. Therefore, we must be spiritually obedient to the practice of yoga. For it says the yogi is greater than the ascetics. He is thought to be greater than even the wise. The yogi is greater than the men of action. Therefore, become thou, O Arjuna, a yogi. Practice these things which you know, which God has sent through the channel. Contact him daily, morning and evening, and at other times when you can. Contact a soul within you, then finally you will be able to act with true freedom from that high vantage point of God's presence within you. We also have in the Bible, we have two or three admonitions which come to my mind. First, in Matthew, the 18th chapter, the 20th verse, when two or three shall gather together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. Be spiritually obedient to that. Gather together as you are doing this morning and do, do it regularly. Gather together in God's name. That's the important thing. They who gather together in my holy name, in the holy vibration of God. That's what you feel here this morning. That's what you feel at all of the SRF meetings because the master spirit is inculcated in those meetings. And so we must do that. We must follow the admonitions of the scriptures to gather together 
in the holy vibration of God. And then again it says in Matthew 6 chapter, 6 verse, when you pray, enter into your closet. That is, go within. Pray to God. Contact God. How? By going within and merging in his holy presence within. You cannot do that except in the silence of the soul within. So have a little place in your home. Have a little altar. Have a little room where you can enter within and contact God as his holy presence in you. So there you have two illustrations of guidance of the scriptures. Spiritual obedience to the guidance of the scriptures, remember, is one of the first requisites to attaining true freedom. Be spiritually obedient to the scriptures. Secondly, and finally, have spiritual obedience to the channel which God has sent. Have spiritual obedience to the spiritual preceptor. Follow his admonitions. Do his wishes in every little thing. Because remember, the guru, the spiritual preceptor, is the voice of silent God. You must be spiritually obedient to that. If you are, then there will be no slavery but true freedom. Then you will see the difference, do you understand, between ordinary automatic action by our ego and independent action as children of God from the presence of God in us as the soul. That's what the guru can give you. That's what the spiritual preceptor can give you if you are spiritually obedient to his admonitions, to his rules and regulations, even to his slightest wish. I have found that out. Now the guru, although he is not here in body, the omniscience of God is nearer than even his presence with us because the omniscience of God is God himself in everything. And a liberated soul like our master and spiritual preceptor and guru is one with that omniscience of God. Why? Why do you think he is not with you? He's absolutely more with you now than when he walked here about us. So, spiritual obedience to attain true freedom means you must adhere to the guidance of the scriptures and perhaps the greatest thing, to the guidance of the channel which God has sent. This gives real freedom, true freedom. Then your will, instead of being, instead of running you in an automatic way, you run things according to God's presence in you. That means wisdom-guided will. And so in conclusion, I might just say that as long as you have your own way, as long as you follow your own ordinary will guided by ego, you will sink deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper in delusion and further away from true freedom. You look at a person who follows the ego and they get cockier and more cockier until finally the hammer falls and they suffer terrifically. Then sometimes they wake up. But remember, if we do as we like, if we have our own way and keep at it, we sink deeper in delusion because then the action becomes more automatic, more automatic. As it says in the Bible, that little which you have even shall be taken away from you. So we must be careful. And then to obey the scriptures and the teachings of the spiritual preceptor, remember, requires more character and strength than to just say, I'm going to do my will today. It takes greater strength to follow the scriptures and the spiritual guru than it does to act automatically and have your own way. It takes much greater strength. What is the result? The reward is much greater. True spiritual freedom, freedom forever from the injustices and from the heartaches and the delusions and the uncertainties of this life. That's the reward. When through spiritual obedience and following the guru preceptor, to the best of your ability, 
carrying out even his slightest wishes, then you get contact with God. Having that, having that, you have the greatest freedom because you have the freedom of God himself. And so humbly following, humbly following through spiritual obedience, the scriptures and the channel which God has sent gives you true freedom, not slavery, true freedom. And I'll end by telling you a little story which will illustrate the point of spiritual obedience. It did for me in a terrific way. In 1920, the master came to Boston, and I had, as you all know, the good fortune and to contact him and sit at his feet. And in the spring of the next year, we took a little trip up the North Shore in April, and it's very, very, very cold there in April. It isn't like today. It's very cold. So we went up to a little place about 40 miles above Boston. One of the students had a summer house there, and so we camped in that summer house, and we nearly froze to death. But that's beside the point. So I was in for some spiritual discipline, although I didn't realize it when I went up there. So the next day, the master took me, and we walked out around. There was a big breakwater jutting out into the Atlantic Ocean, which is cold at that time. He said, let's go out and meditate, doctor. I said, let's go. So we went out quite a ways out and sat down in that ice cold. And I sat on those big granite rocks. And was it cold? And my ego says, you better get out of here before you die. <laughs> but says I to myself, the master has showed me some wonderful things. I knew he was a man of God. And I said, if he can take it, I'll take it. I'll die. I won't move from here. Somehow I got through one hour, and then nature uh, intervened, and I was so numb I didn't mind the rest of it. <laughs> so I sat there for five hours. Five hours. Suddenly the waves began to break. The master says, Dr. Luck, let's get out of here. Let's get out of here. Five hours. But the point is that that spiritual discipline, that spiritual obedience which I subjected myself to, although it was a terrific battle, the ego kept saying, get out of here before you freeze to death. Get out of here. And I said, no. The man is a man of God. I must stay and I will stay. And that effort that I gave in that particular time made it much easier at later dates to meditate any length of time. Why? Because I exercised spiritual obedience to the higher consciousness within. And what was the, what was the result? Not slavery, but the greatest freedom. Then I realized from then on that my ego could not run me because I had made that effort and it passed that test the result of which was true freedom, not slavery.